<laughs> Look at this. <laughs> oh, it's all in for a thousand. All in for a thousand? Yeah. Okay. Today, I was only at like two seventy. I don't know what to do. Then again, I was also trying to not be like too deep or something. Yeah, that's right. Like, I don't really want to play. Like, I know some of the two letter words. I don't know what they mean. All right, I'm taking too long. If I pull the seven twice, I'll pull. Okay. Someone has to pull up twice to call. Oh. Make it one time. No, no. Okay. <laughs> Last one. Okay. <laughs> Shit, one more seven and you're calling? Yeah, one more seven. I'm going to make a call. Finding? Finding. Finding. Oh, wait. No. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. This one, come on, come on. Seven. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Thousand dollars? I'm so unlucky! <laughs> <laughs> I'm so unlucky! What a fucking honor! How did you do that? How did you three bet that and call my four bet? I panicked. Holy shit. Six, six, six. That's not what you want to do. That is ridiculous. Can you send me the footage? Yes. Did you record it? For this episode, I share a cash session a brief tournament session, as well as a status update on my band. This night, I head to Starlight for a 2-3 session. For the first interesting hand, I pick up Ace-10 of spades in the small blind. Only the middle position limps and the action folds to me. I raise it to $15. The big blind folds and the limper calls. It's heads up into a flop of King-10-4 with two hearts. I check. The villain bets $20. The overcard king can be a bit scary, but with second pair and best kicker, I'm not going away quite yet for one bet. I call. The turn is an offsuit king. Actually a great card for me, as now the villain is less likely to be holding a king. I check again. This time the villain checks. Very good sign that I'm likely in the lead. The river is a 7, a brick. I think if I check here, it's going to get checked back a lot and will just show down with me taking this one down. I decide to go for a small value bet, mainly targeting a weaker 10 or a weaker pocket pair. I bet $20. The villain folds. This hand, I pick up ace-queen on the button, only the hijack limps. I raise it to $15. The small blind and big blind folds, and the limper calls. It's heads up into a flop of king-queen-6 with two hearts. The villain checks. This is a board that is very good for my range, and I also happen to hit second pair with top kicker. I go for a small bet of $15, aiming to keep in weaker queens or draws. The villain calls. The turn is a king. The villain checks again. Similar to the previous hand, the board pairs the king again, and I have what is essentially the best two pair hand. Checking here to pot control is okay, I think, but I do unblock all the draws, including both flush draws and all 10 jack combos. So with still a lot of drawing hands to get value from, as well as a weaker queen x hand, I decide to bet for value. Since I'm targeting mostly draws, I size up and bet $40. The villain calls. The river is a brick. The villain checks again. At this point, I think the villain most likely missed and has given up. After a big turn bet getting called, a third barrel is mostly value owning myself at these stakes. I check the showdown, and the villain shows a missed flush draw, and I take this one down. This hand, I pick up ace king of spades on the button. Everyone folds to the hijack, who limps. The cutoff folds. I raise it to $15. Everyone folds except for the hijack. It's heads up into a flop of ace-queen-5 rainbow. The villain checks. Awesome flop for me hitting top pair. The board is also dry enough that I might get a full 3 streets of value if I'm against a weaker ace. I start with a small c-bet, targeting 
that as well as maybe a queen x hand. I bet $10. The villain calls. The turn is a 3. The villain checks again. Great turn card that's essentially a brick. I'm just going to continue with the line of going for, going for value. I bet $25. The villain calls. The river is a 7, another brick. The villain checks yet again. At this point, I think it's pretty clear he has either a queen or a weaker ace. A third barrel is really strong here, so if I'm looking to get called, I don't think it can be a big bet. I bet $35, just giving the villain a tremendous price, hoping he will calm me down with a hand as light as Queen X, but the villain folds. This hand, I have Jack-8 in the hijack position. Everyone folds to me and I open to $10. Only the small blind defends. It's heads up into a flop of 964 with 2 spades and 1 diamond. The villain checks. I don't hit anything and the board is pretty horrible for my range, so I check back. The turn is a king of diamonds, introducing a diamond flush draw. The villain checks again. This card doesn't help me, but it is good for my range. I go for a delayed C bet of $10, really just repping my range. The villain calls. The river is the ace of diamonds. The villain checks again. I don't think I'm ever winning here at showdown with jack high. The river is actually a pretty good scare card with ace king on the board that's in theory better for my range and a flush completing that I block and can rep as well. I decide that it's a pretty good spot to bluff. I bet $30. The villain, however, check raises me to $150. Certainly not what I was hoping to see. Easy full for me, and well played, sir. This hand, I pick up pocket fours in the big blind. There are four limpers, the small blind calls, and I check. It's six-handed into a flop of queen nine four rainbow. The small blind checks. Awesome flop for me, hitting bottom set. I decide to just lead out here and hope someone has a queen to pay me off. I bet $15. Under the gun calls and plus one calls. Everyone else folds. It is now three handed. The turn is another queen. Perfect card with two callers on the flop. Someone for sure has a queen. And maybe both of them do, which would be the dream spot. I decide to check here since Trick Queens is going to be betting for, sh for me for sure. Under the gun bets out $95, which isn't too surprising. What is slightly surprising is plus one making the call. Now I'm just thinking what's the best way of getting all the money in by the river. I look at everyone's stack. The villain directly to my left has less than $100 left, and I don't think there is any scenario that he doesn't get everything in as he most likely has the queen. The other villain's stack is a bit deeper, though I don't quite remember how much he had. Anyways, I'm thinking of the best way to get as much of that as I can. If I check raise here, especially with one cold caller, it's repping so much strength. I decide to just call. The plan is check the river, let the short stack go all in, and if the other villain cold calls again, I can raise for max value. The river is an ace. I follow through with my plan and check. The short stack, for some reason, decides to check and the villain last to act, he also checks. What a disaster. I missed out on so much value. I table my hand knowing I'm good, but I was actually tilting because of how horribly I played this hand. In fact, I was so mad at myself that I took a small break to walk off and record a brief voice memo of how I was feeling. This is right after the pocket fours hand where I hit a full house and um, the opponent had trip queens, which was so obvious. And I am just very not happy with how I played that. I could have raised the turn, I could have shoved the river. I did neither of those. And um, it's not really, I don't think this is being results oriented, but I just, I just hate the way I played it. Uh, it's very rare to hit a full house like that and know exactly what the villain has, but I still managed to not get full value. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of on tilt right now. After returning to the table, I didn't set up to record any more hands. I won and lost some small to medium sized pots, nothing too special. There's one bigger pot that I'll share, which will be the last interesting hand of this session. This hand I pick up ace 4 of diamonds in the small blind. Everyone folds to the low jack who limps. 
The hijack raises to $15. The cutoff and button folds. With the late position open and some dead money, I decide to 3-bet with this hand. I raise it to $45, hoping to take it down. Everyone folds except for the hijack. It's heads up into a flop of king 5-3 with two spades and one heart. Even though I only have a wheel draw, I go for a C-bet, continuing my story of repping ace-king, aces, or kings. I bet $45. The villain calls. The turn is the king of hearts. At this point, I think I just have to give up. Pre-flop play didn't work. Single barrel takedown on the flop didn't work. Probably not wise to keep blasting without any equity. I check, basically waving the white flag. The villain, however, checks back. The river is an offsuit four. And I actually river two pair with a little bit of showdown value. Still, I highly doubt it's good. Turning it into a bluff just doesn't make sense with my line, and I think any pocket pair can easily bluff catch against me with two missed flush draws on the board. I check. The villain bets $200. I tank for a bit. Thinking it through, I don't think the villain can have a king as I block ace-king, and mostly because I can't see anyone ever checking any king x hand on the turn with two flush draws on board. I also can't see anyone at these stakes going for thin value on the river with a pocket pair. So this bet is a full house or nothing. And what full houses can he have? There are zero combos of king four suited, one combo of king three suited, and one combo of king five suited, both of which I think aren't likely to be in there in a three bet pot at these stakes. Pocket threes and pocket fives are possible, but usually these low pocket pairs are pre limps and would have probably raised the flop. There's just a lot that makes a villain lean more towards nothing. I decide to call. The villain says, good call, and I just table my hand and he mucks. Here is a shot of my chip stack before cashing out. I bought in for $600 and cashed out for $1,530. That is a profit of $930. It's now Sunday in the afternoon. Every Sunday, River Rock hosts a tournament that starts at noon. The buy-in is $200. I decide to try it out. By the time I arrive, the tourney has already started, so I skipped two levels for late registration. At first, I actually had to wait at an empty table for a few more players to buy in the tourney before they could balance the tables out. So while I was waiting in the tourney, I hopped into a 1-3 cash game table with a seat open. For a bit, I was multi-tabling in live poker. After a little while, a few more players do arrive to buy in for the tourney, and I finally get to play. Here are some of the pivotal hands. At this point, there are two tables left. Blinds are 400-800, with a big blind ante of 800. I have been pretty card dead and didn't play a lot of hands, so I was blinded down to a stack of around 15,000. This is pretty short. It looks decent with the blinds, but if you factor in the big blind ante, it's less than 10 BBs. Till this day, I still don't know which method is best for counting BBs in live tournaments, with or without the ante. Anyways, I pick up queen 10 of spades on the button. Everyone folds to the cutoff who opens to 2,500. Against the late position open, I can definitely defend with this hand on the button. However, I think that just calling this spot could welcome a 3-bet jam or squeeze that I wouldn't be able to continue. So instead of putting in the dead money, I decide to rip it here. I think I have enough fold equity with my stack against the late position open if he happened to be opening wide. And I didn't mind too much going heads up all in with the really short stack in the small blind. The small blind calls, the big blind folds, and the cutoff also calls. So it's a three-way all in. They show ace-7 suited and ace-10 suited. Not a great spot for me. My queen is still alive. The board runs and I spike a queen on the turn. So with a lucky run out, I'm back in the game. The blinds are now 600, 1200. 
I have a decent stack to play with. I pick up pocket fives in the middle position. Everyone folds to me and I raise it to 2400. Everyone folds except for the big blind. It's heads up into a flop of 866 with two hearts. The villain checks. This is a great flop for my hand, but not for my range. A C bet is okay, but I don't want to get check raised in this spot when I block a lot of the draws. I decide to check back for pot control and try to navigate to showdown. The turn is an offsuit 4. The villain now bets 2000. Pretty easy call for me, picking up extra equity as well as having underrepped my hand on the flop. The river is another 6. The villain leads out for 6000. I lose to 8x and 6x, which isn't too likely with the 3 6s on board, and the board in my hand also blocks a lot of decent 6x combos. I can beat 4x hands value betting and all bluffs. This villain has shown bluffs before, so pretty easy call for me. I call. The villain mucks, and I take this one down. The blinds are now 800, 1600. I'm now second in chips with 60,000, but the top chip leader has an overwhelming lead, more than doubling my stack. He doesn't even play a lot of hands, but this guy picked up pocket aces three times that I witnessed, and was all in preflop every time and got paid off. So he has this monstrous stack from only playing aces. I pick up pocket kings at the cutoff. The chip leader, at under the gun plus one, raises to 3,500. The action folds to me. With kings, I 3-bet to 8,000. Everyone folds to the chip leader, and he 4-bets to 17,000. This is the only guy that covers me, and has only shown pocket aces so far. It might seem like a dream spot with kings, but I'm not really loving it. I decide to just call. It's heads up into a flop of jack 9-5 with two spades. The villain c-bets for 15,000. At this point, I'm putting him only on aces or queens for him to 4-bet and then c-bet this flop. I have the king of spades, so I don't think I need to consider protecting against flush draws here. I just call. Not too sure if I'm good or not, but happy to navigate the showdown. The turn is a queen. The villain now jams all in. This really sucks. The one hand that I was thinking I could possibly beat just sucked out on me. I just can't think of a hand I'm beating now on this board. I block ace-king of spades, and I heavily block all ace-king combos. I really believe pocket queens and jacks are the bottom of his range, and both of those hit a set. I tank for quite a while, and then I make the fold. The villain says good fold, and then he flashes to me pocket queens. Yikes. I managed to get away from this one, but if it weren't for that turn card, I would be in such a good spot. Now, it's going to be a struggle. We are now on a break, and I grab some sushi. It doesn't look super great, but the California roll is actually not too bad. After the break, we get back to battling. The payout structure is released, and here it is. There were 40-something entries, and the first place payout is... $2,800, second place is $1,700, etc, etc. Top 6 players cash. Nothing too interesting happens. My stack is really short. I pick some spots to go all in. I don't get the double up I desperately need, but I do manage to survive for a while. And I actually make it to the final 7. That is my tiny stack, shortest at the table. We have made it to the final table, but we are also on the bubble. At this point, someone at the table proposed bubble protection, or some call it bubble insurance. What exactly is that in a tournament? Let me explain. This is when everyone agrees and decides to chip in extra money to add one more payout spot. Usually, the amount to chip in would add up to the buy-in of the tournament. So, with 7 players left, we all agreed that this amount would be $30 each, totaling $210. The first person to bust out will get the $210, or their buy-in back. This usually benefits the person most likely to bust out first, the short stack, who in this case is me. So I was happy to say yes to this genius proposal. Now, after sorting everything out, back to the game. I pick up Ace-5 at Under the Gun plus 1. Under the Gun folds to me. 
I have a decision to make. With a few people left to act after me, it's not the best spot to shove with Ace Rag. I only have a few VBs left though, and it turns out that the next shortest stack is on the big blind this hand. So I figure that I do have the most fold equity here targeting the other short stack. I got Ace High, blinds are reaching me soon, I just go for it, all in. Everyone folds for the button, who rejams all in. Definitely not what I wanted to see. Everyone else folds and the villain tables pocket jacks. I need to hit an ace to survive. The board runs out, no ace, and just like that, I am out as the bubble boy. Fortunately, because of bubble protection, I do get my buy-in back. I proceed to play a couple hours of 1-3 cash. Can't record hands here, but I do end up cashing out with a profit. So the results for the day. Bought in for $200 for the tourney, chipped in $30 for bubble protection, bubbled the tourney and cashed for $210, bought in for $500 in the cash game, cashed out for $775. The total is a profit of $255. Alright, I do have a status update about my ban. For those of you who don't know, I tell the story, um, I talk about it in detail in the previous episode. I'm not going to rehash everything in detail here. In that episode, I did make a point that the decision makers and management of poker here don't seem to be all that interested in growing the poker scene and working with vloggers. I made a point that they should work with vloggers like Greg Goes All In. Well, I take that all back because lo and behold, Starlight Casinos is hosting the meetup game with Greg. This is just awesome news that I am super happy about. Happy for Greg, happy for the poker scene in general. Apparently, some people do care and are passionate about growing the poker scene like Starlight Casino. Gotta give credit when credit is due. Uh, I applaud and commend them. Unfortunately, I won't be able to go support Greg at his first meetup game in Vancouver. Starlight is part of where I'm banned. By the time I publish this video, the event will have ever, uh, already happened. I hope it's gonna be a huge success. And you guys might be wondering how I was able to share a Starlight session with you guys this episode. Well, that uh, session was saved from before I was banned. For the status update of my ban, Greg, being the great friend that he is, he reached out to some of his contacts that I don't have access to, to see if anything can be done about my case or just to find out what's going on. After looking into it, um, Greg's contact, which would be uh, Starlight Management, uh, told him that my ban was changed from one week to one year because the decision makers looked up my YouTube channel and didn't like the fact that I had videos of Cascades. So they decided that um, one week is not severe enough and they needed to change it to one year. So you might be thinking uh, which video or videos were problematic to them. Um, is it the last video where I talk about the ban in detail? Well, it can't be because uh, when they had made the decision and already changed my ban to a year, I hadn't even started making that video, so let alone publish it. So it can't be that one. I'm assuming they must have browsed through my channel and looked up some past videos that did feature Cascades. I think I have like two episodes. In my opinion, all of them are totally harmless. Uh, especially in regards to their main concern, the whole privacy thing. Maybe they just have a problem with having any footage at all and their name out there in the public. Honestly, I believe that if they did view my channel and videos, it would give them more reason to not ban me. Apparently, that's uh, just wishful thinking. So nothing has really changed at the moment. With the help of Greg though, I do understand the reasoning and that is all I have for you guys today. Uh, thank you so much for watching. If you guys enjoy my videos, please remember to like and subscribe. It does help out a lot. I hope you guys look forward to the next.
A few days passed by after I filmed this segment you guys just watched, and I have another update about my ban. All right, um, the latest update about my ban. Um, a good friend of mine, Trevor, uh, who has appeared in a couple of my videos before, reached out to the Starlight GM, who in turn contacted the Cascades GM, and to all have a discussion about my case. Firstly, I want to thank Trevor. He did not have to go through all this trouble for me, but he did. And with his help, um, I was kind of able to indirectly uh, speak to some of the decision makers uh, through Trevor as a messenger. And I'm not going to go into the details of the dialogue. Uh, I'll just sum up the results. Um, I do want to thank everyone that was part of the discussion that would include Starlight GM, Cascades GM. Yeah, just for even, uh, just for their time and being um, open to talk. Uh, I have a good idea now of where everyone stands. And I do believe it's at a good place for poker, heading in a good direction. For example, um, the partnership between Starlight and Greg is evident uh, to me that I was wrong uh, with my initial perception. I think there's a lot of good intent with growing poker here. And um, yeah, however, there are rules in place that were set from a different era, part of a, a bigger picture, and rules should be enforced. And I respect that. Status-wise, um, nothing has changed. I'm still banned, but um, I just have a clearer understanding now. And just in case it wasn't clear from before, I am being rightfully punished uh, for my own actions uh, that I'm responsible for. That is something that I never questioned. I do hope that uh, my case or cases like mine uh, might help um, spark or generate some talks about perhaps updating policies uh, to align with current times. But these kind of things, I understand, are complex and takes time. And until then, um, in one year, I hope I'll get a chance to uh, meet these people, GMs of Starlight and Cascades, shake their hands and thank them in person. And thank you all for um, tuning in. Uh, your support means a lot to me.